Welcome to the Fullcaster Podcast, Episode 5. Today's guest is Alex Bermudez. I'm pretty stoked to, uh, to bring him on, actually, because I uh, had a long-time uh, coaching gig with him. I've uh, been working with him for several years. Good friend of ours now. And uh, it's going to be a fun episode just talking about uh, not just the coaching stuff on the on the karting and whatnot, but actually this is a, is one of our first like car drivers. He actually does most of his stuff is in the car. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to bringing Alex on here in a little bit. Um, but uh, on a current event, so I kind of want to stay in that vein a little bit and just talk about coaching um, and, and what we do uh, here as coaches here, Derek. I mean, we both do – uh, coaching one on one and yeah. in clinics and stuff like that here at Cal Speed, mostly in the sport carts, and we have generally speaking different clientele. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, usually you're grabbing the fresh, New, newer, newer drivers, drivers if yeah. you will, and I'll have a little bit more of the experienced people. But that's not always the case, and it's a little bit different. But really, what I want to do is I kind of want to talk about not just in that, but also like the CSK Racing Team and stuff like that, what we do and how we do it as coaches to try to help people improve and help them get the most out of it, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's two sides of the, of the fence with, um, with coaching, even in the advanced drivers and sport carts compared to the, you know, the faster drivers or the the top drivers in the 206. There's still those differences that we're going to have. Um, they're definitely both a lot of fun, you know, even coaching the, the new drivers, you know, building someone up from scratch, especially if they continue to do it. But um, I think we both really enjoy our time under the CSK tent and being able to, to coach someone through a race day and not be the official to them. Yeah, for sure. And it's not just the the driver coaching at that point, is it? It's, we're also talking about you know tuning yeah. and, and stuff like that, and and working that the whole the whole process of the the feedback. You know, you're they go out and they hey, we're going to do this in the session, work on this session, work on this particular thing during the session, and. They come back. Oh, okay, how was the car? What did it do? Right. And you and you go through that whole process, which is a hell of a lot of fun under the CSK tent when we're talking about competition carts and uh, more of a dynamic package, if you will. Right with mm-hmm. the, the sport carts, it's basically what can you do as a driver to make the car as good as possible because you can't make any changes. Yeah. Right. So what we do on the the coaching side of the sport carts, it's more about the nut behind the wheel. Right. Well, that is the thing. Also at CSK, we're bringing in tuning and stuff like that. But yeah. at least we're talking about the sport carts. Um, what's interesting is that regardless of a driver's experience, how we go about the coaching process, right? So, for instance, if I have somebody who's brand new versus somebody who's really experienced, if it's the very first time that I'm ever working with that person, regardless, I kind of handle it the exact same way. Yeah. You know, and like mm-hmm. what we've always said is that our our sessions are catered to that person or they're they're you know, custom packages if you will. Yeah. We don't it's just all have fluid. The, yeah, there's no curriculum that's standard like we're going to do this and we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Well, the only standard part is pretty much if we have never worked with you before, we're going to jump out there and and follow you a good chunk. Yeah. And by being behind somebody on track and just analyzing that, you know, I think that's the biggest or maybe say the toughest thing about not getting out on course with somebody and trying to coach is not having that immediate information yeah. right behind him. Because when you're behind somebody, right, you can tell right away how's their vision, you know, how's the line. Are they you can fine tune stuff quite a yeah. bit more for sure. You're bringing all that information in, and then you can have that debrief. And I think that's kind of one of the big things about the coaching sessions that we do because it's the same you and I. Mm-hmm. When we go out there that very first time that we work with somebody or the first pr- time that we work with somebody after a while, yeah, you have that basically the anal- uh, analyzation uh, session. See what you're working with. Yeah. For sure. You know, I think that's the other thing too uh, that is combined with that is you, if you've never worked with them before, you don't know what kind of driver you have. Yeah. I mean, you've told me that before with a lot of the different people that you've had, you don't know what kind of driver you're going to have as far as how they learn. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. I mean... I've had a lot of drivers that are going to say, um, and it's, like you said, it's tough because it's all the new drivers, so they're still trying to figure out how they're going to learn. But um, the easiest way to start off is, you know, are you a visual learner or are you, you know, someone that has to learn by doing? And the visual learners, are just show them a video and just make it easy. Don't just go over the fundamentals with them. And the other people, you know, can be a little bit more, it can be a little bit more analytical with it, but it still comes down to a, 
just keeping it simple, no matter who you're working with, and not trying to throw too much information at them at once. Well, I think that's huge, isn't it? I mean, you, I mean, if you think about all the different things that we can learn or that we can pick up as drivers, mm-hmm. you don't need to throw all of that stuff yeah. out of the gate, you know, and, and certainly in the clinics. Right. I think it can be tough not to do that because you have such, you have, it's a group scenario mm-hmm. and you have so many people that you're talking to and of different levels, right? I mean, you're doing the advanced group this year and I'm doing yeah. the non-advanced and with the non-advanced in theory, you should have, it should be almost quote easier because the bulk of the people should be fairly new. Mm-hmm. So the fundamentals, vision, line, you know, yeah. that kind of thing should be the, the focus, right? A lot of them haven't even been on the course before. Right. Whereas the advanced group, you could have someone who's just barely in there and like kind of still learning stuff and someone who's going for a championship. Yeah. That guy was barely fast enough. And then the other ones that want to work on racecraft, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And in the racecraft thing, that's a whole different kind of coaching yeah. than if you're just working on those fundamentals. So there's definitely all kinds of stuff going on. And what's really fun, right, is when you, you get a chance to work with the exact same people mm-hmm. over a period of time. And yeah. especially if you're taking that and you are working towards a particular goal, mm-hmm. right? And I've had the opportunity to do that with several different driver, drivers where they're they're coming into the coaching deal, like, I want to do this. Yeah. This, I, this is my goal. It's not just I want to improve, but I actually want to win this championship or I want to win a race or a top five or, or whatever it may be. But they're aiming for something. You know, I mean, in the case of our guest today, it was actually I want to get better at not carting. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I don't even this want. This was a tool. Exactly. And that's all it was. It was about going out there and getting seat time, learning, and whatnot, and how that could potentially apply to the car stuff. And I think that's what's going to be pretty fun. And I think without further ado, it'd be good to bring on our guest today. Uh, let's go ahead and bring him on up here. Uh, Alex Bermudez. Come on over, man. Uh, thanks for uh, popping by, bud. Thank you for having me. It's always great to be a counselor. Yeah. Uh, a little bit different when you rolled in here today, isn't it? Yeah. There are weeds everywhere for a start. Yeah. I was actually going to say you brought the growler. That's well, why. there's that, too. <laughs> that was pretty sweet. Yeah. But, yeah, man, uh, we were actually talking to uh, Stephen Clark, who we talked to this morning. And, yeah. It's it's a little bit rough looking outside and seeing all the, the weeds and stuff like that. But it's... We'll clean them off soon enough. Don't worry. <laughs> yes, we will. Wait, isn't that kind of interesting, too? Is it... We do weed eating, like there are the the spray and whatnot, but we don't have to do it that much. It's just the sheer Pretty rare. using it that that'll actually take care of it. Even yeah. just the parking lot, exactly. You know? Yeah, the parking lot doesn't like it gets hit all the time. Yet you look at it now, it's looks like know, a game of Jumanji just happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how quickly it happens. Yeah. it hasn't been that long. You look, yeah. you think back to uh, what is some of those you know, Derek U movie buff, uh, like <laughs> I Am Legend or something like that, right? Yeah, like, it's just there. Times like. Square is yeah. weeds. <laughs> yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. If you haven't been out to Cal Speed, it's not. We're not like it's not taken over by by weeds. Yeah, yeah, it's, don't it's think pretty that. pretty vicious. It's just noticeable. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. So weeds at Cal Speed, but uh, Alex Bermudez <laughs> here with us uh, again. Thanks for coming out. Um, first thing that we like to ask people is, uh, you know, because people are coming from all different walks of life and whatnot. Some people make their Living in karting, you're one of the the guests so far that does not. Um, you do it because it's a good time, I assume. What do you do for a job? Well, I'm in real estate, which is a little bit boring, <laughs> but um, it allows you to erase, though. Exactly, it allows me to do what I love. So I have somewhat of a mundane job, but it allows me to have a great passion and an amazing focus in life. So how? Wh- what do you? What is real estate like? What What do you do? With so, the, are you selling the the houses? What are you doing? No. So I'm basically in property management. I run okay. a small investment company that deals with apartment buildings, the management of it, and the management of the asset itself as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. You just focus out of a uh, L.A. area, or yeah, Burbank, Glendale, Los Angeles, okay. Pasadena. So you're not going out and selling the stuff yourself. Not anymore. But you're managing it. Yeah, so you I did used do, to that do that before. Yeah. So yeah. how long have you been in real estate? Jeez, 20 years, long oh, time. Oh, man. 20 years. If only I'd been cutting for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you're you're doing property management now. You've been doing it for 20, 20 years or so. You've been in real estate doing this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, 
what did you do before that? I mean, you're you're a, a young man. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. That's very kind. <laughs> uh, so, being uh, being of the uh, the middle age, if you will, uh, you've gotten a chance to do a few things. What did you do before real estate, and how did you get into real estate? So originally, I was a photographer. I studied photography in school, if you can call it studying, <laughs> but um, and then I became a commercial photographer. Um, then. What I realized quite quickly is that there was more money in real estate. And so I slowly transitioned into that. I started managing buildings for other people. And actually, that's when the, real, the realization really came that like there's a lot of money to be made in real estate. Uh, back then, I had no interest in racing. What is back then? <sighs> trying to think. Like 2000? When did you go to uh, school? When? Yeah, like what year? <laughs> like late 90s. Late 90s, you're going to school yeah. for the photography, photography thing, yeah. and then you get into commercial photography. Yeah, yeah. Then you kind of do this real estate thing. Yeah, so then, then what happened is I, I had like a side gig, which was real estate. I started managing these properties for people. Ironically, they were photographers. That's kind of <laughs> how I, I, I knew these photographers, and they were, they were getting the industry. out. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so I just, they trusted me foolishly. And, uh, I started taking care of their properties for them. And then, and then what happened is I realized, okay, I want to get into this. Um, and I, I'd been playing the stock market a fair amount, and I was able to take all the money that I had made from that and parlay it into my first building. Uh, and then I promptly gave my boss two weeks' notice. What was, wow. the, uh, sorry, what was the first building that you purchased or invested it's, in? It's a building in, in Burbank, which oh. I still own. Oh wow! Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So now, is it is this your property management company? Yes, you, basically. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So basically, you you now own X amount of buildings, yeah. and you manage all those kinds of things. But it does allow you to frequent the cart track at uh, at your leisure. Quite a bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, but the interesting thing is going back to the photography is that, you know, I. Uh, I discovered racing kind of through photography because what happened was I had met these guys in Burbank, Works 2 Motorsport, and they, they were about to start uh, their ALMS campaign. And I think that was around 2010. And I became pretty friendly with the guy, the, one of the main drivers who, who owned Works 2. And he's like, oh, you're a photographer. You should come along with us. And I'm like, what does that mean? And he's like, around the country and shoot us racing. And, and, and um, this is just somebody that you had met via the. I bought a we, helmet from him. Really? Yeah. So wait, how, hold on. How did you get in? You bought a helmet, but you got into racing. Like, how, how's right? This all... Well, so so I, I bought a Porsche first, right? Which is what like what all real estate people do, right? It's cheesy. <laughs> okay. Super cheesy. Then move, there's right? a there's a there's a it's line. A requirement. You, you, you get into real estate. You <laughs> sell your first uh, deal, and then you get a Porsche. Right. Exactly. It's in that order. Right. <laughs> That's why everyone should get into real estate. <laughs> gotcha. So I leased mine after my first sale. Smart. I couldn't buy it. <laughs> there you go. So anyway, um, and then a buddy of mine said to me, "Hey, why don't you, uh, you know, let's go to the track?" I'm like, "What? You can go to the track?" So I was like, "Okay, cool. Go buy a helmet." Is what he told me. So I went and bought a helmet. And I did a track day, and that was like my first experience. I wouldn't call that racing, but that was my first experience of like being on a track. In something that you drive, right? Something motorsport that, yeah, and, and exactly. You're in your mid twenties. I know. I think then I was like thirty five. Thirty five. Okay. Old. Well, okay. So <laughs> there we go. Let's let's hit pause real quick on that deal. So you're getting into motorsports for the first time at thirty five. Yeah. And obviously, that's uh, a, f a few years have gone by. Yeah. Was absolutely. there no racing aspirations, or let's go to younger Alex? No, I, nothing I mean, at all. My aspiration was to own a Porsche. Really? Oh really? Yeah, okay. like I didn't like the whole racing thing was. I, I I thought that's what superheroes did. You just found it, totally by mistake. Yeah. So okay, let's hit yeah again uh, uh, on the racing thing. So you were more of a car person. Mm -hmm. It sounds like yeah, mm -hmm. so you going through school and what like where where are you from originally? Like are you, are you from? I'm from, from Trin Cal? Trinidad actually. Trinidad. Yeah. So uh, no way I'm near a, here. I thought that was a Burbank accent. Yeah, you right. thought that, huh? <laughs> so you're from Trinidad, which yeah. for the uh, the at home gang, where is that at on the map? It's in the Caribbean. Okay. Yeah. And so, then you grew up there. Yeah, I, I lived there until I was ten, and then I then I left and went to England. I lived in England for ten years. Okay, wow. so you're you're in Trinidad. 
till 10. Now you're in the UK. Yeah. Till you're 20. And then I came to the US. So you did all your, your basic schooling and whatnot for the most part in those two areas. And then you come to the US. Yeah. Why not Trinidad? Why? Why, why, why did I go like, back? How did, yeah, how did that? How did you go to the U.S.? Like, how does that? Because work? at that point, I discovered photography, and I wanted to go to like a really good photography school, and the best ones are in the U.S. Got it. So yeah. that's how that whole thing works out. So yeah. then you come to the U.S. Uh, here on the West Coast, mm-hmm. or the, okay. I went to school in Santa Barbara, a school called Brooks Institute of Photography. So you yeah. go and you you dig the photography thing, you start doing that, and it's the photography of motorsports right out of the gate that mm-hmm. you're doing. No, no, no. I I had like a whole. Um, photography career and then like i said when i bought my first building i i actually got out of photography so how long so you go to school for so photography, actually, and then you start doing photography as your job mm-hmm. how long did you do that before you got into the real estate five six years gotcha yeah, not that long not, and, that, not that long but it was not motorsports photography no it was all like product photography okay. so what happened with works too is i actually started shooting again it's it's almost like i came out of retirement as a photographer and started uh, shooting that so, so before you, that i was shooting really boring stuff like makita catalogs and so you're doing <laughs> photography that's your deal that's what you went to school for mm-hmm. you had a passion for that when you lived in england mm-hmm. that passion seems to like it's 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 not necessarily dying off per se but it's uh it's like i'm not going to make the kind of money i'd like to make doing yeah. that doing this at that time Photography was kind of going through a tricky stage because it was when uh, the whole digital thing was happening and photographers were having to spend a lot of money every year to buy the latest digital cameras, which right. are not like the digital cameras that you guys know. I mean, we're talking about you know $80,000 digital cameras and it, I could see the writing on the wall that it was just going to be, that like the whole industry was changing and it was easier for people to become photographers. And so all this skill set that you spent a lot of time building and developing was going to become less valuable. Surely, it surely is a craft, though. To it is, especially without a digital camera, right? Like yeah, with yeah. Film, right. So, so it, which is what you learned to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the I ca- Kodak disposable cameras, or yeah, exactly. I've used those. Yeah. <laughs> He's like very reliable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there's a whole uh, Kodak 101 actually yeah. in the college, and there's <laughs> also a Kodak moment. Oh, oh. I like that. That's good. <laughs> We're going to cut that out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So the reason why I'm asking all that, because kind of, I had no idea how you ended up getting this far. Like, it not getting into more sports whatsoever until yeah. you're in your 30s. Yeah. Uh, and it's not that you didn't, you just weren't interested. Well, I mean, growing up in Trinidad, like, you're not exposed to a lot of the stuff that you are here. You know, so it's like there are no racetracks in Trinidad. Well, actually, that's not true. There is one, but it's not. It's not a. Re- it's an old airstrip type thing, right? And there's actually a pretty big motorsport scene there now. But when I was a kid, like that stuff didn't exist. I mean, you know, it's all about accessibility, right? Mm. And that's like one of the great things about Cal Speed is that for everybody in Southern California, this is an amazing asset. You know, people can come here. I, what's the youngest? What's the, the age? Five. Really, five. If, yeah. if, yeah, if you have your own cart, five. Yeah, so, I mean, that's amazing that, you know, people can come and do it. I mean, there's no opportunity like that in Trinidad, well, really. But so you but you moved to the U.K. I had to, I have to assume that being in the in, in the U.K., you're, you're surrounded by soccer or football and yeah. racing. Well, that's true, but I was in boarding schools, which is kind of like being institutionalized. So it's like, <laughs> imagine being in jail. That's how why you are the way you are. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Do you want to see my tattoos? Uh, oh, nice. nice. Yeah. Was Jeez. that under the teardrop? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I got those lasered off. <laughs> uh, nice. So anyway, you, you end up coming back here to the States to the, for, for the photography thing. Now, yeah. you transition to real estate because that's how you're going to make the money, et cetera. You, as you say, you kind of come back to do some photography with the works deal. And it just kind of sounds like it snowballs from there because we're talking what what year was that like 2010 ish you said i think it was 10 and 11 it might have been 9 and 10 somewhere around there and you basically get a gig to you're doing the real estate thing mm-hmm. right but you basically get a gig to kind of pick the camera back up if you yeah. will yeah. and go shoot cars yeah which is going to be that's a new thing at that point yeah i'd never really done it before i mean it was pretty easy to figure out but i'd never done it before but it was amazing cuz like Galen flew me all over the U.S. I went to all these great tracks, and I and and I got to like watch amazing racing, you know. And this is the uh, the driver, yeah, Galen yeah. Uh, Galen Beaker. Okay, yeah. So that yeah, it was it was extraordinary. And then the the coolest thing about all that is that he 
you know, so at that time I had, I'd bought a 911 and I'd taken it to track once, hence the helmet that I bought at his place. Um, and I realized almost instantly that like that car was way too nice, new and expensive to throw around a track. So I, I left that track day going, geez, I've spent my whole life wanting a 911, but now really what I need is a cheap boxster to go race, you know? So I, after all that, I realized I bought the wrong car. So I don't know, within three or four months of that, I, Galen actually found me a car. And not only did he find it, he bought it for me and then told me that I owed him money. So I was like, okay, there we are. So it just kind of like happened. That. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and so what, ha what happened was Galen was like, well, you know, you, you buy the car and I will turn it into a box to spec for you as payment for shooting. Yeah, it was awesome. So I flew around the country with him and got exposed to you know, top, top level uh, motorsports. And I got a free car out of it. What, uh, well, you bought the car. Yeah, free a free <laughs> BSR. <laughs> what uh, what kind of races did you go to? You said ALMS, but yeah. what, what kind of races are we talking about? So that's sports car racing, sprint races. They're like, if I remember correctly, they're like 45 minutes long. Right, right. I mean, sorry, uh, more specifically, uh, like what tracks did you go to? What events are these that we're talking about? <sighs> did you end up, I mean, because ALMS didn't run the, the Daytona 24-hour. No, no. But they had the Petit Le Mans. They went to Petit. They had, they went, we went to Miller Motorsports, Laguna Seca. Um, to tell you the truth, I can't remember. Um, Road America. But it was east coast to west coast. It was, yeah, it was, it was all track. over the place. All over the place. It was um, really, really fun. And you were doing not just in the paddock, but you're getting out on course. And yeah, some so, shots. so like I had like a press pass, right? Because I was a team photographer. So like, I, I mean, at the Long Beach Grand Prix, I was in the hairpin and my foot was like on the concrete barrier and the cars are like touching the barrier. I mean, that's wow. how close I was able to get. So I had like literally... Front seat, front you, row seat, you know. Do you still have some of those shots? Like, do you have like a portfolio? Yeah, I have it all. That's awesome. I wasn't sure, like, in that situation, if they owned all of it or how that works. Yeah, they were I mean, they have them all, too, you know, but I have them. They're great. It's nice to look back at them. That's crazy. Yeah, and it was it was a kind of a heyday time for, for Porsche, I believe, in my opinion, because that was, like, the heyday of, like, Flying Lizards Motorsports. And oh, yeah. No, and all sure. that. And so, like, they yeah. were super strong back then. And, mm -hmm. and you know, it was... They it, killed it in ALMS, yeah. for sure. Yeah, they're, not, really they're not bad now, either. It's just yeah. in ALMS, they were, one, they were one of the big well, brands. Now they, and their brand was bigger than it is now, yeah. for sure. Like, they've kind of got... It's changed quite a bit. Yeah. And it, it's really sad to see, because that was... That was an ace team. Yeah. Um, to touch on that for a sec, it was cool. So, I did. I started doing iRacing racing recently, mm -hmm. and... Um, Mark Connell goes on track yesterday on the server, and he's in the Porsche 911. I look over, and he's in the original Flying Lizard scheme, the mm -hmm. the silver and red. Yeah, I love and it. And I, just because of that, I wanted to jump into the Porsche, but I was doing too good in the BMW. But a little yeah. bit nostalgic when you see some of those old things. Like I went and saw the ALMS races at uh, at PIR at Portland International, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, and yeah, I mean that's one cool thing about sports cars is all the different kinds of cars that are in like ALMS or or IMSA now, right? Yeah. But yeah, for sure, seeing those kind of things, and again at the time, being a little bit younger and just soaking it all in and wanting to be the race car driver and all that kind of stuff, and and to see some of those things, I'm the same way now when I see a certain paint scheme or whatever yeah. when I was growing up watching it. Yeah, the nostalgic just it just hits you big time. Yeah. yeah. To, to look over and see that, I'd be like, and I'm going to pull over and get a new car. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> I jumped in like the uh, the BMW, and it was just the black BMW Motorsports team. I forgot. like I couldn't tell you what year it was. But I um, I looked over. I'm like, God, that, that thing was so cool to see that going around Long Beach. And it was that, the um, the Ray Hall BMW, mm -hmm. uh, Ray Hall Letterman, and then the, the Corvette factory team. It was you know, two of each team. It's just these six cars all swap in position. It was just such a cool time for uh, for uh, those sports Corvettes, car racing. Those Corvettes were amazing. Yeah, like the way they sound. Oh, like, yeah, I've never heard of any car that sounded as good as those Corvettes. Oh, it's beefy, man. We were, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and actually, they uh, uh, it's the same engine that was in the Cadillacs. Was it? Yeah, yeah. And the Cadillacs, like uh, on iRacing, you can get the Cadillac, and it's just freaking badass. It's yeah. so awesome. And actually, in uh, in an earlier episode, we were I think it was with Cameron. I can't remember. But we were talking about uh, the differences in the sound. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, I would sit at the festival curves on the braking area at Portland, 
and then be going down in the corner and you'd have the the Audis go by. That was when the diesels came out and they're like quiet. They yeah, can't they, they can't hear anything. And then the vet comes by. It's like whoa, it's so yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah but it's, it's amazing. So so meaty. Yeah, it's awesome. So, so, um, what uh? So you went to all these different tracks doing photography. What was one that you uh, one track that you loved doing photography at? And what was one track that you hated? Bad things happen to me at every track. Oh, okay. Yeah, like Sebring. <laughs> when I was at Sebring, it started off really cold, and I had like a jacket on and everything. And then it got hot, and I took the jacket off, and I was short, sli- uh, short sleeve. I got like the worst sunburn in my life. That sounds like cow speed. Yeah, like the <laughs> worst sunburn. And then I, I, Derek every uh, every weekend. I was, cow no speed. I was at um, Miller Motorsports Park in the infield, which is full of salt, mm-hmm. and my nose started bleeding, like from all the salt. Cause oh, jeez. Because I was in like for for like fifty. Oh, for I think I was there for two hours because. They would let you get in, but like there were certain windows of time when you can get out, and it wasn't in between races. So I think I had to go in there and stay there and camp, and then wow. yeah, it was a nightmare. And then I got like at um, I think it was Road America, the worst ant bites. I put my camera bag down and I'm shooting, mm-hmm. and the ants got in my bag, and then like put it on my shoulder to move to the next location. And all of a sudden, I'm like, what's this stuff on my shoulder? And it's like ants everywhere. Oh, so geez. as far as I'm concerned, none of the tracks were good. <laughs> None of the tracks were good. Oh, okay. But the I shots got, were good. Yeah, the shots were good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Is but, there any way to uh, – do you have any of that, like, is it in, a, in a gallery or anything that, out there? Like, I can certainly I can certainly provide it to you but, guys. But you don't have it. Like, it's not like you've, you have all public. these shots that you've done think, over the years. I think they're on my Facebook page somewhere. Oh, really? Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Deep somewhere, there's a motorsport <laughs> I know, uh, album them. or something. Yeah. I know from time to time I see you share an old photo that you're yeah. – when you're doing that traveling yeah. and whatnot. But yeah. – uh, that's so cool. I mean, it's one thing being a, uh, I mean, I know a few freelance photographers that can jump from team to team or whatnot, but you were able to develop a relationship with these guys and yeah. hang out from, you know, throughout the whole season. Yeah. How long were you doing that for? I did it for two years. Okay. Yeah. Why'd you stop? They stopped. Gotcha. Ah. That stuff's expensive. Yeah. They did what they had to do. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of like a... Because it was their debut, right? Y- y- well, the first year wasn't. First the second year. So they just carried that on. Now yeah. they've got what they need, et cetera. And they, hey, we're out there. And now yeah. it's time to move it on. Was kinda like, it was kind of like the pinnacle of their career type thing. You know, they had, they had run in the POC and they had done sort of... What's it called? Uh, back then it was called Pirelli Drivers Cup. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. I can't remember what they call it now. That, that Pirelli World Challenge? It's, it keeps changing its name. So I don't remember, but anyway, they did a uh, Pirelli challenge, gotcha. and and actually before that it was called Yokohama Cup, I think. So anyway, they did that, and then they then they went to ALMS. So you get the gig with those guys, mm-hmm. and because you basically what happens is you get your Porsche, mm-hmm. and you get your Porsche, you buy a get helmet, a helmet from the guy, and it all kind of get a job, <laughs> right? And then that's how you you go from a photographer. Or excuse me, a real estate person, a photographer to real estate to photographer, Porsche owner, and that's how you get introduced to what a track day is, yeah. Porsche owners club, yeah. so on and so forth. And that's when you just start driving on track days, and that's about right around the time I meet you. Actually, the, there's no, there's there's a little bit of space between. Um, so it probably took me about six months to get. Or actually, no, it took probably like a year to get organized from the first track day. So I did the first track day. I realized that I loved it, right? And and then, but it, but then I started shooting for Galen. We found the car. Then it took a while to build the car and all that stuff. So it probably took about a year. And then, I don't know how many events I did, <laughs> but I would say I probably did like five or six events. And they they were like, what? in the Porsche Owners Club, they called it the PDS event, Performance Driving Series, which is kind of like a timed, a time trial, essentially. It's kind of like a junior time trial because they have, they have regular time trials too. So they have time trials, which is PDS, at small tracks like Streets of Willow, right? And um, Pomona, remember they have that track at Pomona, yeah. like in the parking lot and stuff like that. And um, I probably did like five or six events and then I promptly blew up the motor. Was this uh, were these events just for new drivers to get their feet wet? Or? Yeah, so this is kind of like the POC is really good at like introducing you to to the whole thing. So they okay. have like three levels of of performance driving. PDS is the beginning performance driving series. Then they have time trialing, and then they have cup racing, which is like like their top level. Gotcha. Um, it's a little bit like sprint versus super, super series. series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So anyway, blew up the engine, which was very depressing. Um, <laughs> the only thing more depressing is that is that six other engines would follow of, <laughs> over over a I don't know three or four year period or and something. And this is in the BSR. Yeah, yeah. So so you're doing all the time traveling or the uh, the the performance driving series. Yeah, you're doing all the PDS stuff in a basically a race ready. Yeah, like BSR. because I was convinced that if you put me in a car at speed, I was going to flip it over fifty times. So I had to have a full cage and. And Galen was like, look, if we're gonna, there's no point half building it. Let's just build it. We, we know where you want to go. We'll build it from scratch for you. And you can, you'll just drive it for your whole career Get in the, used in the to PLC. It, yeah. yeah, which makes sense. Um, so what happened was it blew up the engine, totally depressed. Next door to Works 2 Motorsports was a place called Racer's Edge Karting, indoor karting, right? <laughs> so, so, so all my friends who I sort of started with, including Tom Stone, um, you know, they were all progressing because they didn't blow up their motors. So they were going to these events. And I was, I was like, I'm going to fall behind. And of course, I'm super competitive, right? So I started go-karting at Racer's Edge. And in Racer's Edge is a uh, electric indoor place. Right. Uh, yeah. Where's that at again? Out it's in, in uh, Burbank. 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 It's, r- it's literally right next door to Works 2. So, and two blocks away from my real estate office, which is very convenient. Wow. So... <laughs> And so this literally is how you get the the reason why you get into karting. Because I blew up a motor. Is because you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, look, man, I got into this thing the whole the wrong way. Yeah, okay, it might yeah, be yeah. the most expensive way to get into karting. Absolutely, right there. that's not. Yeah, for those of yeah, you listening, that's was, not how you have to do it. The <laughs> engine was probably like. Seven years worth of karting. You didn't. I was about to say you didn't have to go rebuild the engine. You could just <laughs> stuff with karting. <laughs> true, true. But anyway, so. You jump into the indoor stuff. Yeah, and I and and I loved it. And I, I was going literally. I went to that karting track every lunchtime, for I don't know how many years. Because I mean, Galen built rebuilt the engine, but I I would still just keep going back, keep going back, and it just I became obsessed. And and I think that's when, that's when I started to understand this concept of like, you know, how important the driver is, right? And I think that's something that, on some level, in certainly in non spec racing in in cars is lost to some degree. I mean, people are very focused on the performance of the car, but I, I became very interested in like, well, how can I become better as a driver, you know? And so I just kept going karting and karting and learning stuff and talking to people. Um, so that was my start in go-karting. Roughly when is this? So I don't know. I'm so bad at remembering these dates, but I would say that was probably like 2011 and 12, onwards until i turned up here and when did you come out here first do you remember i came out here with chris wilson do you remember chris wilson he's a he's a pro driver he was one of the coaches for galen and and we became friends and then he came out here with me and this was a couple years before i met you and he just came out with me and we you know he he sort of coached me from the sidelines um and that's the time when i spun in a horseshoe we you know that you remember that so Back in the day, we used to have a uh, uh, PRD Sodis. I think you did. This is in the two-stroke, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah. So we used to, when I first showed up in uh, 11, um, one of the things that we had was the high-performance school. Yeah. And it was uh, this fleet of like six or so Sodi carts. With a PRD on it. Yeah. And we're Sodi uh, competition carts, you know, not like the, the Rabin drives. And, uh, and they all had PRDs, water-cooled. It's, you know, like a slower uh, X30. And they were, we we were putting people in and like doing schools and stuff like that. But there's a lot of times where if you, you know, you knew what you were doing or whatever, you could jump in there and just cut laps and do do that kind of thing. And if it's grande counterclockwise and the horseshoe tightens up on the exit, sometimes you go a little wide. Mm-hmm. Especially when you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> Alex has slipped through the cracks on this one. <laughs> we somehow got led in one of these carts. I don't, yeah, I don't know how it happened, but. I think that was probably that that had to be early eleven, yeah. Because I don't remember this at all mm-hmm. whatsoever. So it must be just before I got here. Yeah, it could have been, and and then and I thought, okay, wow, this place is cool, but I didn't think much of it, and I just kind of went back to my indoor karting and 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 you know, racing in the BSR, time trialing in the BSR, and then and then I yeah, think you I, weren't racing yet, right? No, still just time trialing stuff yeah, at the yeah, time. Yeah, just learning how to go fast on the track. Yeah, because I think when you did start coming out here. Um, and doing the coaching thing with me, you were still doing would, the the time trialing and wanting to do the racing. I it think I think end. it was right at that transition. Yeah, yeah. You know, which was 
which was 13 and 14, somewhere around then is when I started race, cup racing, like the end of 13, and then 14 was my first year. Yeah, and the, one of the best things is he, he comes out here and we're doing coaching in the uh, the old club carts, Yeah, the Stratuses, which we only used for like the MPPKI League at the time and Machismo, uh, Machismo right? And Petit Machismo. And, and actually um, Pro Series. Which didn't happen until 13. But, ah, so gotcha. prior to 13, we were only using it for Machismo, basically. They'd be mothballed the entire time, except for MPPKI, mm-hmm. uh, which now runs the sport carts. Point being is we were running a cart that we don't typically run. We don't run in our championships or anything like that. So he wants to do coaching, but he wants to be in something faster. Not the we. I think we did one session in the two strokes, I think. I don't remember. I can't remember. We might have we might have done one, but then we end up, we definitely do one in the... In the, cl- in the the club carts and stratuses, and you promptly put it in the fence. Sounds about right. Yeah, and <laughs> I don't remember. Of course, right but... away he was behind. <laughs> me. He was a followed leader, and he f- he didn't follow me because if he had followed me, he wouldn't have gotten into the, <laughs> into the wall. But the point is, I was like, hey, why do you want to do the the club carts or whatever? You should do the sport carts because we do all of our racing. He's like, I'm not interested in racing right now. I just want to get faster. I just want to. I just want to get better. I want any. I want to get better for the car. It, there was. I'm not gonna race carts. I'm not no gonna interest, do that. Yeah. It's. I'm just doing this to get better in the car. That was it. And you bit your tongue. And I bit my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> and I shut up and I just helped you out yeah. as best I possibly could. And you did a great job, I have to say. Well, we, we've gone full circle multiple times around that circle. I think <laughs> at this true. point. <laughs> yeah. I I remember I remember you and I discussing the carts and which ones we should coach in. And, it was, and and we had the discussion, well, which one's closer to the car? And I think that's why we ended up in what? that one. I mean, that's why we're in the 206s now. Yep. You know, yep. kind of you know, jumping way ahead. But, mm-hmm. I mean, that's certainly – it's always been about how – like, and this is the thing we were talking about in the very beginning with the coaching, right, mm-hmm. is as a coach, your job primarily is to make sure that whoever your student is gets what they need. Yeah. You know, it, it's – Yes, a lot of people, I mean, I obviously am not making my money doing coaching. It's not what puts food on the table. But at the end of the day, as a coach, pure, you know, the purest of me, it's all about making them better or at least getting them what they need. And if the, the person's like, hey, I just want to be a better driver and how I apply this to the car or stuff, then that's what you do. It, we don't need to go racing if we just want to learn how to drive better. And that's where the whole, you know, Running yep. the Stratus carts came into play, and I mean, and it worked well. And that's what I was just gonna say. I mean, at that time, what's interesting is you had actually mentioned you had had some instruction, mm-hmm. uh, not hand holding by any means or anything like that. But let's actually hit pause on that that coaching side of things. And you get into the the car stuff. You start doing the the the, the time trial, the, the the performance stuff, and whatnot. What at what? Because you had already done some of the competitions if you will prior to meeting me and i think they were the time trial ones or the the performance ones right yeah well so so just going back to the coaching for the second i mean one one thing again about the poc that is really good is they have like a coaching program now the coaching program is not necessarily the best because it's other drivers within the club but it's but it's like that's kind of part of the club philosophy it's more of a mentorship it sounds like exactly so so you're getting a lot of feedback and and a lot of it's really good you know um, so I had had a lot of that. And then there's um, the chief driving instructor, and I became pretty good friends. His name was Marty. And he, I started, he started coaching me. I, I was, you know, we worked like one-on-one, um, and we were doing that. I don't quite remember. Well, that was for sure, like, before I started coaching with you. Um, so, so I did have some, some coaching in me so to speak. Didn't show it well. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. That, that, that hurts, Mark. That hurts. <laughs> Showed it right into the fence. Of the <laughs> he thought the motor was going to blow. He was like, I think this will be cheaper. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's smart. Yeah, put it in the fence. Replace a tie rod, not a You're motor. You're supposed to be nice to your guests. Oh, yeah. We Whoops. Been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you come out here. 
you had just got done doing uh, the performance driving stuff, whatnot. You're coming mm -hmm. out here, to, but it's all about getting better in the car. Yeah, it's, right? it was very car focused, and you know, again, you you taught me things that were that now seem really basic, but are super important, like vision, right? I mean, we worked a lot on vision, and at first we worked a lot on speed. We didn't touch racecraft, right? It was all about like speed, consistency, and precision, right? And and we kind of worked on that for a long time. I don't remember how long we worked on that stuff for, but yeah, it was a while. It's gotta be a year. Yeah. I think, I mean, yeah, that was the whole thing is because you weren't racing yet. We yeah. were just, you just needed to be fast, as, as fast as possible, but yeah. as consistent as possible. And not only that, being able to analyze what you were doing wrong because it, you were not in the cart. Mm -hmm. So that's that was the big thing is how do you take this and apply it to the car so you can be better at the car? But yeah, yeah. it was 100%, just pace. Yeah, yeah. And well, it worked because I, I won the championship. So Yeah, so explain that a little bit. So you end up, the, the, there's there's multiple levels, as you said. Yeah. There's an actual championship for the the driving series, the performance driving series. Yeah, for each for each one there's a championship. I believe that I won the performance driving series championship prior to us meeting. And then I and I was time trialing. And actually I I don't think I won the time trial championship. I just I was just again building up speed. And then and then we went straight into uh cup racing. And in my second year of the cup racing I won the championship in two thousand fifteen. And that was in BSR. Yeah. Yeah. And you didn't just win the championship, right? Or you won the championship, and then the next driver year, of the year, driver of the year, yeah, driver the of the year, year, and overall points champion, yeah, three big cool trophies. Yeah. Wow, and and that's one of the things too. Like the, the trophies are the, cool. Yeah, the trophy, the <laughs> POC trophies are are pretty sweet. They, yeah. they spare no expense. And I gotta tell you, whoever whoever put their time and effort into the the POC <laughs> trophies. <laughs> Yeah, well, that almost was me. Like, oh, <laughs> oh, almost like there was an incentive to, to put <laughs> yeah. in the time. Well, the trophies used to be really bad, so I decided that I would volunteer, since it's a volunteer club, to design the trophies. And the funny thing is, my inspiration was Cal Speed trophies. Oh, nice. Right. We set the bar. Yeah, I you like did. that. You do for a lot of things. The cart track did it. I <laughs> yeah. like it. I like that. That's nice. All right, so you said uh, overall points championship. Now, you're in the BSR class, right? So you won that championship. And you won the driver of the year, which is badass. What is the overall championship? So that is where they tally up all your points from every individual in the club, regardless of class. So it is it is the driver that tallied up the most points, regardless of, of class. Okay, ba okay. So like it'd be like a, a tri C or whatever. Well, for instance, if you win all the races. Mm -hmm. You're the overall champion because right. you won. Okay, I got overall you. Overall points champion. So you basically had the best results regardless of class. Right. And that's actually saying something because in the BSR class, there's a decent number of drivers. Yeah. Um, there are actually more drivers today than when I did it, but for sure it's the most competitive class. It was then and it is today. Gotcha. So you not only won the most competitive class, but you did well enough to earn more points in your you know, yeah. overall deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Running in the most competitive classes is something I'm very interested in. I feel like it's very easy in motorsports to hide in small classes and look good, which to me is somewhat disingenuous. Big fish, small pond. Yeah, and you know I'm all about authenticity, and it's like you gotta you gotta fight the big fight and see how you do. You know. Well, and that's kind of your transition into uh, Spec Racer Ford too, which mm -hmm. we'll get into in a second. But so while you're doing the Porsche deal, we had talked about how. You started out, and it wasn't about racing; it was about driving, mm -hmm. just getting better as a as a as a driver, and uh, and doing the time attacks and that kind of thing, and then getting better as a driver. And then, how do I race? You know, we're testing in cars, or excuse me, we're working in the carts, but it's for the car. Mm -hmm. And then we make the transition. We start making the transition slowly. We've been working on how to race, and we're doing it in the sport carts at this point. We've mm -hmm. we've moved from the from the club cart over to the sport carts. And it is all about, okay, how to outbreak and how to, to think about making maneuvers and all this other kind. We're working on a racecraft. The chess game. Exactly. Playing chess. And then it accidentally, because, again, this is all cars. It's all about cars. And then it accidentally turns into, well, I'm going to go and try to do well in carts. And ironically, it's kind of how you got into karting in the first place, right? Right. How yeah. had that whole thing transition? So after the 2015 championship, my 
my goal was to like back it up and win the championship again in 16. But that all went horribly wrong when in the first race I blew up my motor. I think it was a sixth motor, sixth or seventh motor. I lost. You don't count motors. No. That's just too depressing. <laughs> Not right? after so, two. <laughs> yeah, Although, exactly. hey, to that point, though, I do remember, I mean, it was depressing. Yeah, it was and depressing. And you were just like, oh, come on already. Yeah. Like, because it wasn't just you blew it up. It was you blew it up, and there's not like a fresh spare hanging out no. right here to throw in the car. No, nope. and that was I remember that was the the turning point, whether you liked it or not. Yeah, it was the turning point to to make that transition. Yeah, so that was the point where I realized, you know, like the box to spec platform is probably not the best race car platform. It's a street car that's converted. It, you know, it's it wasn't really designed to do what we were doing with it. And the engine was definitely a weak spot. I mean, I proved that. Um, and I remember blowing it up and I was sitting in the trailer of uh, the team that was taking care of me and I was just so depressed. And my coach, my driving coach, Craig Stanton, he happened to call me. Sports car uh, badass. Yeah, in yeah. yeah, he happened to call me back. I'd called him a few days ago. And I, I, you know, I can't remember what about, but you know, he happened to call me back and he's like, well, how's the race going? I'm like, well, I just blew the engine. He's like, oh no. And I remember saying to him, like, dude, you know, I, I, I can't do this. I'm like, I'm blowing up engines so often, you know, it's just, it's just too painful. And then he had said, oh, you know, maybe you should check out Spec Racer Ford. And I didn't even know what that was. And I'm like, Spec Racer Ford. I'm like, yeah, I was like, whatever. Because the duration of your racing at this point had been exclusively in the POC. Yeah, and exactly. And maybe a bit of the PCA, I believe, as yeah, well. Yeah, a little right? bit. Yeah. But it was b very Porsche centric, right? I was interested in Porsches, so I wanted to race Porsches. Although I think, being exposed to go-karting kind of made my interest in racing less brand specific. And today it's not brand specific at all. You know, I just right. want to race something good that's reliable and, you know, competitive, super competitive class. Like that's the most important thing. But anyway, so Stanton had sort of said to me, check out spec racer Ford. And I had no idea what that was. So, you know, I, I left the track early cars a mess. It's smoking. And, um, I go home and I start Googling what Spec Racer Ford is. And, I, and I'm like, wow, this looks good. Um, but, but it took me a while to transition. Like I, I had to fix the car, put it up for sale, buy a new car. And that took a lot. That took, I think it took six or seven months. So in those six or seven months, that's when I came to you and I said, let's go for the championship in sprint series yeah we're, we're transitioning from getting better in the car exclusively to all right i'm all in yeah. let's let's make this thing happen and and that was we were i mean we were already coaching yeah damn near every week for a couple of years yeah at that point i want to say yeah. and and again focus on the car but it's not like we were starting from scratch mm -hmm. it was just that now we have a carrot and the carrot was as you say the sprint series yeah and uh, this is, I want to say this is 2016 this happened. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And 2016, you didn't win a single race. I know. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I remember you leading at one point, and you went to the outside mm. in Contino. I remember Around a well. lapper, and you got moved up the track, and then you, uh, you ended up losing that position. Derek, you've actually... I did the same thing <laughs> we did. a week later in practice with you. Yeah. It was the yeah, same scenario. And I, I don't think it was a week later. I think it was the Sunday. Oh, it was that next I came day. back. I was so depressed about That's what happened. Right. I said, Derek, let's go and practice this. Yeah. And we went and did it, and the same it, exact thing happened to you. Yeah. Yeah. Idiot. Derek's like, let me show you what it looks like <laughs> from the outside. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. where I'm oh. going with that is, no, you did not win a single race, no. but you did win the championship. Yep. Yeah. You won the Sprint Series Championship, and you were also running, because you were going all in on this deal, you were also running Super Series at the same time. And how'd you do over there? I won Rookie of the Year, I believe. It yes. was pretty awesome. Yes, I, I don't remember where I finished, but I know it was kind of high. I don't remember. Do you know? I won it. Eighth? Uh, not that high. No, I, I don't, don't think, think it was eighth. Maybe but it somewhere was around top 15. 15 to 12, yeah, maybe okay. somewhere in that. But yeah. you you make the transition. You basically go, hey, all right, my car program has gotten the finger, right? It literally blew up. Yeah. And I'm, I want to go racing still. So I'm not just going to go racing. I'm going to go all in, which has basically been your MO since the very beginning, is if you're going to do something, you're not just going to put in a bunch of time in the seat. You've always been kind of a 
in fact, you, you've had that, the kind of the joking hashtag, but will it make me faster? That's right. Yeah. Right. And it's, it's been practice. It's been coaching. It's been health. It's been all, it's been, you know, mind, the, the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And that kind of all in attitude, I think is partly how you can go from starting out in this game as late as you have, right. When the mid to late thirties or later, right. Mid-30s. And, and we're getting after it now. So you go from not driving the, or to having success in the Porsche. I'm going to go back it up and nope, you're not. Yeah. And you go sport cart racing. And in the sport carts, you out of the gate have consistency, doing well. You're not like setting the world on fire because, like I said, you didn't win any races or anything like that, but you were always at the sharp end and you were consistent. And the consistency is what you got you the championship. Basically, everything that you had worked on for all those years, right? I just need, I need to be good at, at fundamentals and laps and also the kinds of crap, but also that tenacity. What was the thought process coming out of that? So you put all this hard work that you've been putting in and it culminates in an, a, another championship. This one, in, your first one in carts. Mm-hmm. What's the thought process at that point? Well, because you're going to go say, cars again. I, I would say that I would say that once I won the first championship in 15, I became very interested. I may have been a little bit interested in it before, but I became very interested in the concept of winning championships. You know, like winning races is, is great, although I didn't have that much experience with it apparently <laughs> in karting. But, but you know, it was the concept of like you know gaining the points um, and and like the long the long game, right? And I think that's why I came to you and said, okay, 16, let's go for the championship. We're going to run both both Super Series and Sprint Series. We're going to just go through the whole process of running every race and thinking about it as a collective collective race, essentially, right, the championship. Um, and I think that's something that I, I'm very interested in today. Um, I, I don't know if that answers your question, though. Well, I mean, so... Not only, I mean, everything you just mentioned about that the, the collective race, if you will, mm-hmm. right, and kind of making that that mindset change to going for a championship. And again, if we think about the way you started, you were just trying to cut laps well, mm-hmm. and then turn from I want to cut laps well to I want to, I want to win this particular thing, mm-hmm. and then I want to do well at this particular thing. But it was really all about driving well. And then I think maybe even before the the cart deal, but the the car deal with the championship there, maybe it all starts there. You win the sprint series, you win the super or the, uh, the sprint series championship and the uh, super series rookie of the year. You're going into the next year. I remember you wanting to do the super, like go for the super, do as well as you can the super series, Mm -hmm. but it was already starting to take that back step a little bit. Right. Because the car. Right. So, and that's, that has been the bane of my existence in carding, right? Is it, it's really hard to do, both because they seem to be what what I my theory on this I'm not you know be interested to know what you think but as you get better at both the similarities start to 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 widen right? yeah. or they become less similar and I think and what I noticed was if I'm doing well in a go kart I I'm I'm not doing as well in the car because it's actually a slightly different skill set um, so. That was 16. So in 17, I was all in. I think I did all the races in the Super Series. Yeah. You know, luckily the schedules allowed it. But I was focused again on racing the car, which is a new car for me. And and, and I, I it was hard to kind of do both because, you know, I'd come to practice and you, you would tell me, oh, yeah, you're driving it like a car, not a go-kart, right? So And then it would take a while to sort of adapt. And then I would notice it when I'd go back to the car on a Friday practice I'm definitely throwing it around like a go-kart and have to smooth it out a little bit. Um, so that that was, I started to realize that then, that that was happening. Um, but of course, at that point, I was very interested in both racing carts and cars. At that point, I was committed to both and just trying to figure out how to do both. Yeah, yeah, and that was actually, uh, again, you, you, you did better. You were inside the top 10 in the Super Series yeah. and finished second and the Masters Championship mm-hmm. at that point. And that was kind of the last time that you went all in mm-hmm. on the on the karting stuff. But since then, again, with that, that same focus, 
in, uh, I want to say it was 17, you did select two. That was when we started doing the 206 thing. Mm-hmm. Did select 206 races yeah, in the Ironman. So, yeah, that was a lot of fun. And, and actually, so that was my first real experience with the LO206. And to this day, I don't know why, but I think that cart and that formula just suits me perfectly. I, I felt like I was really confident in it to begin with, like right out the bat. I had success right out the bat. Um, and I, I, my theory is actually that it's much closer to Spec Racer Ford. So now when I jump between the two, the, the transition is not as great. Yeah, I think that's the that's the biggest thing. And actually, so I want to ask you on that deal. We talk about the, the as you say, things kind of splitting apart a little bit between the, the carts and the cars. We're doing the two things. Well, you were doing arrive and drive carts, mm-hmm. right? Very stiff chassis, not a lot of... You know, no no flex, they had really hard tires, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. The 206, even though, again, uh, not massively quicker like that, it is a proper chassis. It's on the VLR chassis, 206 engine, and softer tires. So it is a little bit more, it's mechanically, it's, it's a race cart, right? Mm-hmm. Do you think that... In general, that is the when, when you started doing the two hundred six thing, and the fact that it there was more to do about the you and the cart as a unit versus you have to adapt to what the car is giving you. Now yeah. you have to actually kind of like you would you would with the car. There's feedback. There's we can adjust things. There's it's more mechanically. There, there's mechanical grip there that you didn't have before, and therefore things that you need to do differently as a driver. I think there's a lot of very subtle things that add up to a big difference. I th- I think to be really good in a sport car, you have to be able to adapt really quickly. Right. You know, qualifying is about adapting like in two corners. And I would say that that is not my strong suit. So when I originally rented the LO206 from you, you gave me the number 10 cart, and you gave it to me, I think I, originally I did three races in it, right, with Tri-C. So we've gone yeah, forward is, a little this bit. this is last year, yeah, 2019, yeah. you did uh, some CSK racing with Well, us, let's yeah. go back, though, because I think, I think when I was doing the Ironman, you also gave me the same chassis every time. I think no, we, they were mixed around. Did they? They were different, yeah. Oh. Okay, but I had more time to adapt to it. Yeah, an hour. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I think what it is is that I just had more time to adapt to it. And that that and then the speed came more rapidly. Right. You know, in the super series and of course sprint series, you know, you're jumping around all these chassis, and I just don't think I'm that good at adapting to them. That well, well. And I think also too maybe the way that the 206 strives just everything being softer, mm-hmm. you felt it more. That's true. That's know? true. I, also, I think that the style of driving is very different. You know. One has bumpers and one doesn't, so that kind of lends itself to a very different kind of driving. One is a little bit less precise than the other, mm-hmm. and I, and because of course, I've spent so much time in cars. That preciseness is something that I know, and and that's just the the parameters with which I drive. Yeah, and not necessarily preciseness in the driving per se, but certainly in the racing. Yeah, there's a, a yeah. bigger margin of error, if you will. You can do more with wraparound guards than you can exactly uh, without although you should do the super net sometime it's yeah you might as well have wraparound i've guards. seen that actually yes <laughs> so so i think to me those are the two different things you know my strong suit is not adapting super quickly and the style of driving is different but uh, so and then uh, coming into coming into this year uh, so actually, let me back up. So you're doing the uh, you just get a little bit of a taste of the 206 yeah you're doing the spec racer last year you go, I think it's last, no, excuse me, 2018, right? You go all in on the Spec Racer deal. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to say this is your first full year in the Spec Racer learning experience, the whole kind of stuff. This is where you're doing a little bit of the 206 at the mm-hmm. same time. Yeah. And the coaching that you and I are doing at that point is a little more sporadic. And again, it's shifted back to what's better for the car. Right. Um, now, last year, um, you, you've applied everything that you learned, et cetera. How does. How does the 206 compare to the spec racer, and how do those two things complement each other as someone who's really focused on getting better at the car? The 206 is definitely stiffer, and you feel more in it. But they're very close. They're definitely closer than the sport car. But again, it's driving. Like you, you, There is no 
margin for error, unless you're in the super NATs, apparently. But, <laughs> you know, I mean, like, contact is something that, it, you know, that cannot happen in either. Um, and you're talking about not just, uh, like, tangibly, but also in officiating. Right. Yeah, they, yeah. they really frown on any kind of contact yeah. at SCCA. Yeah. Now, they both, one of the areas where I'm still learning is, is like, gi you know, giving my mechanics in the car feedback about what the car's doing and if we can improve it. And like with us talking under the tent and figuring out how to modify or make the adjustments on the cart. And so that's starting to come in and that's like a whole nother learning curve for me, right? Because of course in the Boxster, there were very limited adjustments that you could make as a spec class. There wasn't a whole lot you can do. And of course in the sport carts, you have to adapt. There's no adjusting, right? right? Now it's learning to make those adjustments both in the car and in the go-kart. And so that that's a fun and interesting thing to see. Yeah, and that's actually what uh, last year with the three races you did in the 206 mm -hmm. with the CSK racing team, that was one of the first things we started working on was actually having feedback yep. and actually having to work on something because you had to do that with the car, and it wasn't just like go out there and drive it. It was like, okay, what did it do? Oh, it's good. No, no, no. That that's yeah. doesn't – what – Exactly. How, how is it – and just because it's good doesn't mean it can't be better. Yeah. And trying to analyze what's going on out there. And learning, yeah, learning to, vo to, to have vocabulary to explain what's going out there so that the mechanics can understand, okay, if, it, if this is the way it's behaving, we can change this to do that. And then going out again, and of course, that's the whole point of, you know, Thursday and Friday test days, right, is to get all that dialed in. Is there a, a similar uh, kind of situation like that? Are, are you finding that the conversations that we have are when we're talking about chassis setup or changes, are they is that a similar deal to your engineers with the MBI? Yeah, I mean, it seems like the way you make the adjustments is different between the two, but you know, me describing what it's doing is the same. You know, just how they're interpreting it. Then no, but, no, because I think a, a go kart, the way you get it to behave, if a go kart is pushing. You might not necessarily do the same thing to it to a right. car that's pushing. I got you. Yeah. Right. So, so what what is decided to what, what people decide to do might be different, but the the symptom is the same. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. And actually, I just pointed out uh, uh, MBI, and we haven't actually said that, but you you run for MBI, uh, which is what, and they are based out of where. Well, so MBI is is Spec Racer Ford team, and they are out of their, their shop is actually at Buttonwillow, like on the premises, which is great. Yeah, you can actually see MBI as you, like actually when I was driving to the uh, the cart track. Mm -hmm. So you go in and they've got a you got to pay at the gate kind of thing. You got to go in and then you make a left if you're heading to the cart track and there it is MBI yeah. right on the left hand side. Oh, cool! And correct me if I'm wrong, they actually have um, like arrive and drive opportunities there. They can go yeah try stuff out with those guys. Yep, they have a couple of rentals. So can we I should look can at I rent that. your car? No. <laughs> <laughs> Good, good answer. Good answer. <laughs> they uh, just put your body on the rental. They're like, yeah. we got to show this thing's got that, results. That happens a lot, actually. Oh, the really? bodies swap around. Yeah. Like right now, I, uh, like the first, so I did two races at the beginning of the year before everything got shut down and uh, my body was being painted. So I'm basically running random bodies right now until they finish mine. I saw the picture. I was like, that doesn't, yeah, it doesn't look, look like, like Alex's car. car. Yeah. yeah. Alex going around making sure it's the right serial number on the chassis. <laughs> yeah. like, Wait, hold on a second. <laughs> And actually, you've got uh, you got a couple of uh, friends now that started doing like you did the Porsche thing, mm -hmm. and like you said, you had some friends and whatnot over there. And actually, I coach one of your friends and now one of my friends, Tom Stone, mm -hmm. in the carts, and he has just made the transition from uh, the Porsche stuff, also BSR, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. We were in the uh, same class, the same class too. Now doing the spec racer, and he's just starting out doing that this year. But he's not the only one. Uh, you've had. Mike Skinner. Yeah, that's right. So Mike Skinner and I, we actually left the POC at the same time, and we both bought spec races at the same time. Yeah. The corruption is complete. I know. <laughs> I'm taking everyone with me. <laughs> you got the right for free. You just had to bring two customers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> how did, uh, how was the transition? I, what, when you went from the BSR, which, uh, compare that with the spec racer, and what are the differences, and why do you like more than the other, and blah, blah, blah. It's lighter. It's way lighter. The I mean, SRF. Is. Yeah. So the box to spec with me in it was twenty six fifty, I believe. The the 
spec race for Ford is sixteen fifty. So that's a big wow. difference. Wow. wow, that's a big difference. You know, I didn't think it was gonna be that big. No, no, it's big. Yeah. Wow. Um, and power difference. So the Boxster, well, my Boxster was like 100, 195 horsepower. The spec race of Ford is, I think, one hundred and thirty-five. So it's less horsepower, but it's greater power to weight ratio. And you've got stickier tires, if I yeah. Remember. And that was the biggest thing. So. The engine, it's still mid-engine, so the feel of it is very much the same, but it took me a while to like build the speed to use all the grip that the tires had. So we used to use uh, Toyo tires for, for um, boxer spec, and we're using Hoosiers now in okay. spec race at Ford. And the Hoosier is more of a slick. Yeah, and way softer compound. It's way grippier. Would you say that the fact that a go-kart is rear engine, that it helps you? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you're also driving on Hoosiers this year for the 206. Yeah, I nice. love it. I love it. And actually, I think I think I adapted to them really quickly. No, that's not. That's no, not I did. I totally did. <laughs> well, we actually have only done the one race. It was at uh, Tri-C. Yeah. And who, um, who won that race? I couldn't tell you. Yeah, some joke. <laughs> yeah, can't remember. Some joker. Huh? <laughs> yeah, and actually, uh, to that point, yes, uh, Alexander Bermudez was the uh, was the winner. He adapted to the tire really well. Very, long, very long first coming. win. Yeah. You had had... Uh, Three seconds, the last of which was painful. Was painful because you passed under <laughs> well, yellow. Well deserved. <laughs> <laughs> I will say. Thank you, Derek. Yeah. Always like your support. Keeping it honest. Oh, CSK. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. So, yeah, three. But, and I got to tell you, that was pretty stout last year. Or excuse me. Yeah, last year. You come out and you, you rent a ride. It wasn't, mm-hmm. we had, you know, other guys who owned their carts and lease carts, et cetera. And you would rent a ride and take the old quote. Our rental rocket, if you will, and yeah. uh, and go up front and and do well, uh, both in qualifying and in the heat race and so on. Not always in the heat race, but you always found a way to be there in the main. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't like you were out to lunch second; you were in the hunt for the win, second place. Yeah, every time. And I gotta say, I wasn't surprised that you were in the hunt again for the uh, for the opener this year. Uh, but it was well earned. You yeah. you had uh, you had to fight. It's for a it. good race. Yeah, I think with you and Pietro. Is yeah, that correct? I, yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Pietro. Yeah, there's definitely one. You know, the Tri C races have a slightly different rhythm to what I'm used to in in the sprint se- Well, in Super Series, and I think it's kind of taken. I'm still working on getting that rhythm right. You know. In terms of the, the racecraft, you think, or no, like just the, the sort of qualifying in the race in the race, oh, like gotcha. just, just All right. I was struggling, you know, I, I would find myself in those in those heat races, kind of in the wrong place for that first, you know, for the first two corners, which gave me a position problem going into um, horseshoe, if you remember, and so that like you know I hadn't used I hadn't raced that track in a while, so there was a bit of a rhythm that I had to sort of figure out, and I think. That meant that I had to work harder later on. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. So again, playing the chess. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and again, with with something like that, with the two hundred six, where it's actually less horsepower than the sport carts that we have, mm-hmm. it's actually not unlike what you would just describe with the Porsches yeah. and the Spec Racer. I didn't realize it was less horsepower. Yeah. So just the, lighter. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's almost identically in, tra- in in comparison. You've got the sport cart, which is heavier mm-hmm. considerably, and has more power versus the 206, which has less power and is considerably lighter. Yeah. Um, and obviously more nimble, has softer. It's almost the exact same scenario. So we should have made this adjustment a long time ago. Yeah, well, <laughs> so be it, you know. We, um, we've made it now. Just because we're talking about between the, the cart and the go-kart, uh, the car and the go-kart, um, have you been in the car or vice versa and whatever – scenarios happen in front of you and you're like this reminds me of exactly that time at button willow or you're in the it car. happens to me all the time really? all the time and it tends to happen more where i'm in the car and i do something and i'm like cal speed gotcha <laughs> yeah it happens all the time you know <laughs> I, I mean all my racecraft has been developed at cal speed so anytime there's chess going on in the car it's cal speed and, and right. actually the interesting i hear that all the time from Tom Stone and and, and um, Mike Skinner, he's like, oh yeah, you know, I, I drifted the, the car around or whatever, just like I would at at, at Cal Speed, you know. So that's pretty that, cool. Yeah, I mean, there's a big presence at MBI about <laughs> Cal Speed. Yet none nice. of them come out here and play. Yeah, they do, well, <laughs> some of them in Cal, in uh, Tri C. No, it's been cool. Skinner got the cart. 
Oh, that's right. Well, yeah, okay. No, was, no, no, I'm no. talking about MBI, MBI. No, MBI, oh, MBI. Right. Uh, one of the drivers, his sons, run in, in oh, Tri C. Really? Yeah. Who's that? Um, CJ. That's his name, CJ. CJ. I don't. You don't oh, know him. That? You don't know him. I don't think. No, it's got a bad. There's not that many CJs out there. Do you know what class he's running? No, I don't know. It's Do little, you know anything? Little kids. No, I don't know. Gosh. I don't even know why you invited me. <laughs> <laughs> that of information, this guy. <laughs> um, is uh, and I'm I'm curious to ask you this: Is there a um, a voice that you hear in your head? Yes. When you're when you're driving, it's not Mike's. Is it okay? It's, it's not. not. That's Mike's. good. Gotcha. Yeah. It's good. Because, well, we'll get back to that. Yeah. Usually, when I do something wrong, Mike just stares me down in his helmet. There's no words through the visor. Yeah. yeah. But Marty, there is a, got, there is a visor look. Hasn't yeah. gotten that? Yeah. But, but all he sees is this when he's first, looking at me. My first <laughs> coach used to talk to me on the radio, right? Which which we don't do. But so he, when we would be in a corner, he would be telling me what to do, where to be looking. You know what I mean? Like you know, keep your eyes up or whatever. Going right? through the course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so his voice, and that's Marty. He was oh, my first gotcha. real coach. And so quite often, I was actually just, uh, a friend of mine invited me to go to a track day at uh, Streets of Willow, which I hadn't been to in like five years. And nobody, <laughs> nobody actually races there. It's kind of a track day kind of track. Mm -hmm. And it was so funny because I'm going around it and I can hear Marty's voice. I haven't heard, and I haven't been on those corners in five years, but I could hear him. So that That's does happen. That's pretty neat. Yeah. That yeah. is cool. That is cool. I can't think that I've, uh, I've actually ever had anybody else's voice other than my own. I'm only like, I'm only like don't F this up. Or, hey, focus, you know, just that kind of thing. But I can't think of anybody else that it will, like, you know, pop uh, in my head like that. I think know? it happens when, you, when you're on the radio. So yeah. do you remember Eric Oviat? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Eric, when I was in, in 2015, when I was going for that championship, he was on the radio with me. And so quite often I hear his voice, too. Because you end up, like, attaching whatever they're saying to you to that corner, you know. Mm -hmm. I got you. So, there's, there's, so I think the radio makes that happen. So to add on to that, uh, extend that uh, question really quick. What uh, gets in your head when you're driving and you start to wander? Mike and I had this talk not too long ago about like. Or like you get, lose focus or yeah, whatever. Yeah, you're getting out the last few laps and you start having some BS pop in your head. Is there you know, like so that? That, it, that's a really interesting question because I spend so much of my time focusing so that that does not happen. Right. You know, like, so I have, um, I have like a performance coach mm -hmm. who works with me to sort of basically keep my head screwed on essentially mm -hmm. a lot of times you know i'll get riled up and that's generally what she works on is me staying calm and and sort of in the moment do you so think you get excited or angry when you say riled up no so the way it works with me is it tends to be uh attachment like i'm attached to a certain position right like if i'm in a race and i know that like okay i'm i should be in first place right and somehow someone out qualifies me. So then ah. I'm like totally riled up going into the race and I will be like way too aggressive on the start of the race because I should be in front of that guy. Yeah. And what I've had to work on is to like be calm and just let it happen. And, and I would say the last race that we did here, the Tri-C race, that was very much a situation like that. I felt like I should have been at the front and I kept having bad luck and I kept falling back, but it was like, okay, just be cool. Just work your way up, be calm, don't do anything too rash. You don't have to be in a hurry to get there, but you'll get there. And and I and I felt like, you know, sure I won the race, but the but what I'm really happy about is I was able to keep my cool. Nice. And um and yeah, that is you, you that's, didn't do it from pole. No. Yeah. Yeah. You had to earn your way there. Yeah. And so that's a big thing for me. And that's slightly different to what the question you asked about, like focus at the end, right? I got you though. But, yeah. But I would say that focus at the end is also part of that. Like it's I, I go through a lot of training to make sure that my mind is focused and not distracted and not not dwelling on things that are not important. Right. I mean, so. him and I were talking not too long ago, and some of the thoughts we'll have, and it's it pops up more so with us, I think, than other drivers because um we have you know Heather doing photography for us at CSK, so mm -hmm. or at our races. So we'll come across the line. I'm like, or we'll think about coming across the line. Oh, what are we going to do for the photo? Mm. Or, yeah. You know, oh, I'm thinking about scales already. I'm thinking too far ahead, mm. you know? Yeah, that's a problem I've had and since it's, always. It's so interesting. But only when I'm leaning. 
Yeah. No, same. Only when I'm leading. And so when I'm leading, I get really stressed. And I'm like, now I have everything to lose. I only think about that in the last couple of laps. Yeah. Well, I, I should say something about like to lose, but again, it, I only think about the, and I, I should say when I'm leading by a, a bit, mm-hmm. that is the only time this ever pops up. It's like, I've got this in hand, provided I don't F it up. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. all you ever think about, don't F it up, or provided I don't F it up, who do I got to thank? Yeah. Where do I, you know. I'll, yeah, yeah I'm not thinking about that. I've already, the race is already over, and that's such a dangerous thing yeah. no, to I don't, happen. I don't do that. And in fact, it's interesting you said, well, what am I going to do at the start finish, right? I don't know if you've ever noticed, noticed but every race I've ever it's won, just, I just drive through it. Yeah. I'm not doing any of the stuff because, like, I don't even know where the other people are. And, like, you know, they might be right behind me. And I think, it, it, man, we're just, you got, well, <laughs> we're pretty confident in the 206 shit. Yeah. And, uh, and, I think it's just something funny for us that we like to do. No, I get it. Know? I totally get it. Um, and it's, and, oh, no, it's, and I, it's a very go-kart thing. No, no. Actually, it. I would say it's just a very knowing what the hell's going on in the race thing. I think it's an awareness deal. Like, to be honest with you, the right, the issue is thinking about who I got to think, also the kinds of crap. Like, that is that is a mental issue that I have, that apparently you have, et cetera, mm-hmm. that we got to figure out. But actually, being jubilant or being happy at the line is because we see the checkered flag. Mm-hmm. Like it's just the sheer awareness of what's going on and the awareness of who's like you just said, you have no idea. Well, because where everybody could be else right is. behind your nose and you know, you don't But know, my thing right? is I already know that. Yeah. Like exactly. I, I'm coming exactly. out of the final complex and I already know whether or not I've won or not. Yeah. Now, foot down and if go I straight. Don't That's... know <laughs> that I'm not celebrating. But Mike, do you remember in that last race, I came up to you in the paddock and said, "Did I win?" Oh, no, it was a great race. Yeah, that's, but do you remember that? I didn't even know. No, I wasn't even sure. that's how tight it was. Yeah. Yeah, so in that particular instance, yeah, I could see how maybe you wouldn't know. Now, But I, I, I think I, it's because I just become tunnel, so focused yeah, tunnel vision, yeah. on, like, the job at hand. I have Sure, um, but you were, like, winning by a mile in some of the other stuff that you've done. And I still and you came did, up yeah, to you and said, did thing, I win? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I'll have the issue during the race, and it happens probably, like, more than half of the races I do, I have a song playing in my head. And the song's always random and different. Hmm. Like, uh, I remember um, thinking back to a, a, a Super Series race where I had to start from behind. I had... Um, Got a long way to go <laughs> nice. and a short time No, it was actually... Uh, it was Pain by Jimmy Eat World. And then it's just... That Like that was the day I remember like music started playing in my head. And ever since then, it's, it's changed and changed and changed. Mm. But I'll be thinking about the line and, and what I got to do as far as driving it and who's around me and, and all that. But I'll always have a, some random song that pops in my That's head crazy. for some reason. I think it's so freaking distracting. I think <laughs> in the it. car, you kind of have more time to think. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? And well, certainly the, there's longer distance between corners. Yeah. So sure. and everything kind of happens slightly slower. Right, even though you're going faster, everything's slower. We talk yeah. about that in carts. Actually, when, car, when people are making the transition from cars to carts, yeah, and we talk about vision, right, and getting eyes on apex instead of looking at turning points or breaking points, it's because shit's taking you know less time to happen. You got to be quicker. Yeah. yeah. So for sure, yeah, it's the yeah. exact opposite. So, and the reason I bring that up is that for sure in the car, I think more about stuff. But usually, so if I'm leading. There's a couple things I'm thinking about. I'm, I'm looking to see where the next guy is, right? Right. And I'm like, do I need to push or can I just sustain? Mm-hmm. Like how much risk do I have to take going forward for the amount of laps that I have, right? And and I, I think on that level at least, I'm a pretty calculated driver mm-hmm. because as soon as I'm – like if I'm chasing somebody, it's like 100%. Like yeah. I see that guy and I'm going to get to him, right? And then quite often what happens is I'll pass them. And then I will sustain. I will actually slow down because I don't want to drive off the track or, yeah. or make the mistake. You don't want right? to go 110 percent, right? Yeah, and yeah. And, blow it. and so then what happens is I evaluate if they're catching me or not, and then I will then make assessments on how fa- how hard I have to push to keep them at bay, so to speak. I actually do the exact opposite. Is that I I drive hard every lap mm-hmm. because as soon as I have found that I start to dial it back a tick. I start making mistakes. Mm. Right. You know, you I, have to keep yourself there to stay focused. Yeah, the main I'm, difference is that in the car, you're losing your tires at no, the no, end of the race. I'm not saying that I'm driving too hard. Mm. I'm just driving the same. Mm. The same way that I got to the front or that I started where I did and whatnot. 
Now, the, what I've noticed is you can do things very, very subtly to, to, to take care of the tires, which is what I'm starting to learn mostly this year, but just a tick last year mm-hmm. with the, the cart tires. Because in the with the Evinco Blues that we have on the KAs and definitely in the 206s, the, the tire fall off isn't as big of a deal. It's right. not really something I have to worry about. But I've, actually, ironically, we were talking about this this morning with Stephen Clark. But with the Reds, it is absolutely a thing. You can absolutely overheat them and then not have tire left mm-hmm. uh, because some of these rices are really long. Right. Um, and that's actually something where it's not so much, you know, you can over you can overdrive and, and, and overheat those tires. But you can just drive, quote, hard or drive, you know, at 100%. And that's not overdrive. That's what I mean is that you're driving hard, but you're not overdriving. You're not cooking the tires. But I'm not dialing it back either mm. you know i have dialed things back on a chase but not it, it, well not leading yeah no i try to stay as focused as possible and boom 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 hit the, hit the hit the laps i know that happened to me with uh at lancaster mm. where i was in a street course right so there's it's narrow you know margin of error and i, I want to make sure i hit the exact same mark every time and every single time i tried to take it easy even a smidge I would make a little mistake. Hmm, so I'm like, interesting. Piss on it. I was tucking every time the same way, trying to do the same lap every single time. I, I don't know. I don't think I do it in go karts. I think I only do it in cars, and I think it's because the tie is just the personality. of The tie has changed so much from the beginning to the end. Right. And it's like usually the other thing too is I'll evaluate the person behind me, and he's not catching me, and it's because he has the same tire problem. You know what I mean? And it's like okay, I can just keep it here. You're in the front. He's not even close to you. Just bring it home at this point. Yeah, right. I've done that on the last lap. So that that kind of yeah. that's kind of that's you know when you ask me what 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 happens towards the end, yeah. I basically am like I hear Craig Stanton's voice, which is hit your marks, yeah. right? Vision, hit your marks. It's probably your voice too, right? <laughs> but um, you know, and, and then and, you hear them high fiving each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Finally, Alex figured it out. Yeah. <laughs> All of these you know, years. Yeah. So 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 basically, you know, the last I don't know four laps or whatever if i'm leading and it's not and it's not a battle in other words the guy is not right behind me just then then it's it just, around yeah, yeah just like clean with minimal risk yeah you know what i mean and i, th- I think actually that's and that's what, what I and when too. i say i dial it down i'm probably talking like yeah three percent not much right i mean yeah. it's not like i'm going down 20 yeah. percent. i mean you, you catch me if that's the case it's just uh-huh. enough to like okay there's no a little error. bit of room for error and exactly. you're fine. Yeah. I got you. So that tends to be what's going through my mind. And sometimes I can do that, and sometimes I can't. It just depends on how close somebody is to me or if I'm even leading, right? Yeah. You know, if someone's on my tail, the last race I did, I battled a guy from start to finish. Wow. He was right there the whole time. Going so. back to, like, now you've gotten a chance to, to – you've done the, the spec race for now for, you know, a good, good couple of years – Got a chance to, to run at a few different tracks, mm-hmm. you know, travel around a little bit, uh, even on the East Coast of Smidge, right? Mm-hmm. And you got a chance to do that a little bit with the car, uh, excuse me, with the Porsche as well. Is there is there one event or one race or one track, or is there something that you think back on? And maybe it's one in the Porsche and one in the spec racer or whatever. Is there something right now where you're like, that right there was the was the coolest damn weekend or event mm. or whatever is there one that you know, sticks out well not so much weekend um all the weekends are cool right um but watkins Glen is an epic track and oh, that track looks fun it's it's just so epic and hands down that's that was the greatest weekend because of that i mean an amazing track now we ran it road america and that was really special for me um the, the lady that managed the team for Works 2, she actually lives right next to Road America. So when I went to Road America, 10 years after, I shot at that track for her, essentially, right? For Galen and her. Um, she came and had lunch with me. No, not lunch, dinner. She oh, came and had cool. dinner with me. And she was like, it's so cool, Alex. Here you are. You know, when I first met you, you were like this starry-eyed kid who with his <laughs> camera, all dorky, you know? And you're on the sidelines shooting this and dreaming about doing it. And 10 years later, here you are racing here. That's cool. Yeah, it was pretty epic. That's awesome. And I, and I like that. I like that. There's that circle, right? That it goes back to works too, and and, and the photography. The, the biggest thing I'm a fan of with you is that at your age you're able to make the. I mean, it wasn't a dream for you at your childhood, but you're able to make 
the quote jo- uh, childhood dream come mm-hmm. true and become a race car driver. Yeah. And man, no matter if it's club or IMSA or F1, it you're racing cars and you're doing it. So that's just awesome, you know. And you got to do some so much cool shit. <laughs> like, well, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate no, I that. That's awesome. Like, that is pretty sweet. When I um, I, you guys know how it started in a wall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> so. Yeah. Right at that time, I was like. Don't yeah. know about this one. <laughs> <laughs> to that, that, that same uh, that same token, uh, you've gotten a chance to to do sport carts two hundred six. You know, got a chance to drive, you know, two stroke. Mm-hmm. Uh, did some endurance racing. Done mm-hmm. done some different things in carts. Is there uh, a particular karting event or something? In uh, again, not an achievement per se, uh, like a championship, or whatever. But is there a particular? moment or a weekend or a win or anything that like i remember that as being super cool racing for me is about the challenge right so i think the most challenging events are the ones that i remember the most and so i think going into the sprint series finale with the same exact points as i can't remember her name uh, Ashley. 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 Ashley uh, Arnold. Yeah. And I was so stressed. I think I slept for an hour. It was actually a three-way uh, battle. It was was it? you, her, and I want to say Caden. 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 Yeah, Caden, Caden. Caden. Yeah. yeah. And I, I was so stressed. And back then, like, I, I hadn't sort of – I mean, I'm much more calmer driver now, right? And, like, my head didn't get the best of me. Well, it's definitely rookie stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. And uh, like I said, I, I tried to sleep, like, the whole night. I'm just up. I literally had an hour and a half sleep. And then Mike Skinner drove me to the track. I slept in the car as he was driving me to the track. And then I slept because I think we did the Ironman and then there's like a, a rest or something. I think back then we did... Um, clinic. I think it was still the clinic, but it was clinic, clinic Ironman, sprint. And, then, back then. Yeah. sprint. and I, yeah. think, I think I didn't do the Ironman. I think I slept through the Ironman. <laughs> and then it went into that. An hour-long nap. Yeah. And, and I think the fact that I managed to pull it off that that was very memorable because like that was it right e- going into that race with the same points do or die yeah, yeah. it was whoever's you know. going to be in front of the other one yeah yep. you know and that that was pretty epic um, the machismos pretty awesome you 12 know 12 hour race yeah i mean those are epic um, i've been very lucky i think i've won two of them and <laughs> i'll never forget seeing patrick britton who was my teammate pushing the cart into the pits and I'm like, what? Like, I, I know, like, you don't push carts into the, into the pits, right? For you people listening, no. you don't do that. That, <laughs> yeah. that means something has gone seriously wrong, you know? And yet, again, you know, succeeding in the face of adversity. You know, we had, right. I don't even remember what the problem was. All I remember is seeing him pushing it in and going, that's not good. And, and to have won that race was very epic, you know? So things like that, those kind of things where, like, there have been races where, like, in spec race of Ford where I've been hit at the beginning of the race, you know, and you, you go off track and somehow I managed to win the race, you know, I get back and just fight my way. And, that, and that's happened, you know, it doesn't necessarily happen in karting with it within a single race, but like you have a really bad start to the day and it puts you way back and then you work yeah. your way up and you, and you crawl your way back and, and, and then eventually you win the main. Right. And th- those kind of, again, it's about facing adversity, right? Because in the end, Racing is kind of a metaphor for life, right? And it's like, if you can fight through racing, it means you can fight through life. Oh, wow. That's deep. Probably the deepest moment we've had so far on the I show. I think so. Came from the right guy. It did. The one I'd expect it from. Well, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, certainly the, the most uh, elder statements, statesman we've had so far. You know, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to remind everyone. <laughs> hey, you know what, though? One of the cool things uh, about you, Alex, is uh, that we had talked about already in the show, right, is you got, you, you didn't start doing this when you were a little kid. Hell, you didn't even start it in your 20s. You started this thing in your 30s. But you, when you did come across it, it you started more of a, of a, as a car person mm-hmm. and whatnot. And you happen to have some, some pretty cool rides, right? Mm-hmm. We talked about it. You do own a, go, a couple of go-karts. You own a spec racer Ford. That's what you go and race in and have, and have a fun uh, on the racetrack. But you also have some street cars that are pretty cool, starting with 
your BMW M- uh, X5. <laughs> yeah. No? No, is that not what we were talking about? That's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> that's the daily driver, right? That's what With you're getting dents around. and scratches is, all right. over it. But actually, all joking aside, you uh, you drove up today in what you call the Growler. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about that car real quick and, uh, and what it means to you. Hmm. Well, so that car was actually built by a really good friend of mine who, I mean, I met him because he was the race engineer when I was racing in the POC. And uh, we became super good friends. And he, he uh, I'll never forget. He's like, hey, you know, I've got this car that I think you'd really like. And I, and I was like, well, what is it? He's like, it's this 964, which is an air-cooled car. It's 1990. And, uh, and at the time, I, re- I really wanted to buy like a more modern Porsche. I wanted to buy one of those. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the GT3 RS, the orange GT3 RS, orange and black one. I always loved that car. I was like, I don't want this. I don't want this thing from the 90s, man. Yeah, yeah. I want this this one, right? <laughs> but you had already had your your first Porsche yeah, this time, right? Yeah, yeah, And I had a Boxster, too, if you can call that a Porsche. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> but anyway, um, and I said, okay, yeah, I'll drive it, whatever. You know, and I kind of blew it off. And then like three months later, he's like, you know, I, I'm really thinking about selling it. I think you should drive it. And um, I said, okay, all right. You know, just to appease him, like, so he stopped bothering me. And I get in this thing, and like literally before I left the parking lot, the thing just blew my mind about how how visceral it was. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just it just attacks your senses, you know. Um, earlier I used the word theatrical, right? It's, right. it's a very theatrical car, um, and it's not. I mean, by today's standards, it's not super fast. It's still definitely fast. I mean, you, you can go straight to jail in it. Um, but it's really about this experience that you get from just driving it at, at reasonably fast speeds, um, which is something that is kind of lost on modern cars because they've become so fast. You know, uh, I was actually just having this conversation the other day, and I was telling these people that I was with that you know, like that's the problem with modern cars; they're so fast that to actually get them to wake up, y- y- you're going like you know 150 miles an hour in a sports car, you know, closer to 200 miles an hour with a really good car, and you know, that, that's just crazy. So older cars are so much more fun to drive because you can really wring their necks mm-hmm. and you're not doing 200 miles an hour, right? right. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in cars that do have that sort of theatrical feeling um, and you can enjoy it at sort of reasonable speeds. And the Growler does that perfectly, you know. One of the things that, uh, uh, before, we, uh, before we put an end to this thing, one of the things I want to uh, ask you about is, your kind of return back to photography a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you had mentioned before that you had you had a passion for it as a kid, uh, go to school for it. You end up kind of putting that by the wayside to make money mm-hmm. to have a have a career, which you have a career and you're able to make money and whatnot. But that and it, and it was it was the photography that gets you into racing and blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. But again, it kind of got pushed over. And now though. I almost feel like it, it keeps coming back into the, into the forefront that your photography is, is now maybe more a part of it, but maybe more of a, the passions back versus it being a, a way to go get the money or whatnot. How would you say your, your passion as a, as a young person starting out in the world putting off by the wayside and how that's kind of come full circle now, but really linking that passion in with the racing and stuff like that. I guess what I'm getting at is joining the two things in one and how maybe you can appreciate those things now years down the lane that maybe you couldn't have done before. Yeah. I mean, photog- I, I mean, I'm, I'm fundamentally a creative person. Um, so photography for me is a creative outlet in a way that, Racing isn't. Ra- racing is kind of like a performance outlet. It's about it's about me trying to be the best human that I can be, right? And and racing kind of forces you to do that. Th- I mean, to be good at racing, you you have to be like totally on your game. And so, racing is a vessel, in a sense, for me to be able to do that. And then photography is a vessel for me to be creative. Um, I used to th- say. And I think it still holds true that, you know, like racing is fundamentally destructi- just destructive and photography is constructive, right? So they're kind of a nice uh, blend together, you know, to, to do both, right? Because, you know, in, in the car, you know, 
I mean, it's destructive no matter what. Like if you drive a perfect line, don't hit anything, you're still destroying it, right? I mean, the wear out the parts so quickly, you know, your tires are done in a weekend, all this kind of stuff. And so it's nice to be able to like do photography where you're creating something, you know? And, and I think that's why I had so much fun with Instagram for a while. Um, what I've found lately though, is that I've become like very interested in the outdoors. Like I'm doing a lot of hiking and running and uh, trail running and all that kind of stuff. And I think in, actually that is sort of like the idea of nature and racing. Cause again, racing is all about asphalt and heat and, and it's kind of oily. And right. then you can go into nature, which is green and, 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 and quiet. I, I find those two are a more interesting balance for me now. I think, I think my journey with photography, photography tends to sort of come and go for me. You know, <laughs> if, if, if it's a really interesting project, like, remember, I, I did all the, the stuff for Petrolicious, right? So, I mean, that was like someone, you know, they, they approached me and they wanted me to shoot all these interesting cars. And at the time, it, it kind of made sense to me and it was really fun. And so I think nowadays, the great thing about the position that I'm in is that when it comes to photography, I'll just pick and choose projects that are really interesting to me. You know, it's not, it, again, because it's not something that I have to do to make money, right? So I can, it can be more of a passion again. And, and quite often, you know, I know in your case, you're kind of an exception. But, you know, a lot of times when you, when you have a passion and you turn it and you, you monetize it, right? It kind of ruins it. You know, and, and that happened to me with photography. Definitely, like uh, when I was shooting catalogs and stuff, I mean, it wasn't what I had envisioned, right? But it was able to put food on the table. So, so now, like, I just shoot what I want. And, and I think that's a huge privilege. Got back to the fun of it. Yeah, exactly. And at the end of the day, I think that's the one thing, too, about racing. Regardless of whether or not you do it for a living or you're doing it for fun, it's got to be for fun. Yeah, it has to be an enjoyable experience. To your yeah. point about that, the, the photography. If you have a situation where I have to do this to mm -hmm. put food on the table, that's that could be stressful. That could really take the fun out of it. Yeah. If you are focused on, I have to get these results. I have to go perform. That can take the the fun out of it. And that is a that is something I struggle with every day, as you well know, right? I mean, that's that's one of my projects to work on is to have more fun racing and to not focus so much on the results. And I feel like last year, I, I, I started to do that. I mean, last year I won the championship and I didn't know I was even gonna win it until like, I think one or two races before the end. I never, you know, it, it used to be, I'd look at every, the points at every race, right? And now I don't even look at them because a smart guy once told me, go have fun and the championship will take care of itself. I wonder who that was. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. If you, uh, yeah, if you can just concentrate on doing what you like to do and focus on hitting your marks, like yep. uh, Stanton would say or whatnot, then the points should take care of themselves indeed. Well, hey, man, I got to say, I really appreciate you coming out here and, uh, and hanging out with us. That was a fun conversation. It was a hell of a lot of fun, enjoyed it. Um, especially with someone with uh, with so much uh, experience doing different things and getting into the game late, but still showing that you can get into the game anytime and have a hell of a fun, uh, a lot of fun doing it. So thanks for coming out and playing with us, man. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. All right.